Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jake Reynolds from uh, CISL, that's the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. And I'm, I'd love to welcome you to this webinar starring Dr. Bojan Wang, who's going to be talking with us about assessing climate risks in aviation. Uh, this is uh, directly drawn out of his uh, research program, which is very kindly supported by Heathrow. Before we get into um, into my introduction to Bojan and, and something a little bit about what he's going to be saying, um, I'd like to note that the participation for the event is is what I would say usefully diverse. We have uh, participants from the energy sector, from the transport sector, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, but also many financial institutions have joined and a number of other business sectors and foundations. It's quite a mix. And I think when we're looking at the issues uh, that uh, Bojan is going to be covering today, it, it, it's clear that where we're focusing on climate risks in, in aviation, there are very parallel um, conversations taking place right across the economy. And I hope that um, those of you coming from different perspectives, different sectors, uh, are able to translate some of what we uh, learned today into your own practice. So just a note, first of all, before we uh, get into the webinar about the program that Bojan uh, participates in, it's called the Prince of Wales Global Sustainability Fellowship Program. We kicked this off at CRSL in 2018. We have 11 fellows who are all undertaking projects with us, which have a strong research, in most cases, strong academic research foundation, but not uniquely perhaps, but less usually, have also a very strong application focus, a strong focus on where does this research actually drive sustainability impact. And it's not surprising that in many cases the, uh, the fellowships have been supported by uh, industry, uh, by, corp by companies, and that is actually an illustration, I think, of the relevance and the relationship between the challenges which those companies are facing and the need to access in a uh, digestible form the best of academic evidence and thinking, which is what the fellowship program is all about. It's about harnessing what we understand uh, from within universities and other research institutions and bringing that to bear on business problems, uh, particularly acute ones such as the one we're looking at today. So um, I should say also in the case of Bojan, his fellowship is very integrally tied into work we are, wider work we're conducting in CISL through our Centre for Sustainable Finance. In fact, Bojan more or less sits in a virtual sense uh, alongside uh, Dr. Nina Seeger, who's uh, within the Centre for Sustainable Finance, and they work very closely together. In fact, Bojan um, has other uh, cooperative links in CISL. And for us, that's very important because working as a researcher, one needs to find partners both inside the organization and externally to uh, design the research and implement the research with. Of course, that helps with the generation of impact uh, along the way. So very pleased about that. Um, what I would say is that, um, you know, Bergen is came to us very qualified for this work. He joined in April 2021, and prior to that was a postdoc uh, researcher in sustainable aviation at Shanghai uh, Jiao Tong University in China. He actually has a PhD in energy and transport and an MSc in, in, in energy and environmental economics, both of which are from University College London, UCL, and has a quantitative research background, although he promises not to put too much of that quantitative work into the presentation today. Uh, he also has a, um, uh, a background in transport economics and data science and scenario modeling. And that experience has been applied in aviation, shipping, and emissions trading. So that's that's Bojan's background. His fellowship, if I could just very briefly summarize uh, before we get into the detail, it's one of the first in-depth financial risk assessments that encompasses both transition and physical sources of climate risk through scenario analysis. And the outcomes that he's looking for <clears throat> are to understand the economic and financial implications of climate-related risks in these transition pathways to net zero. We hope it will help the aviation industry and policymakers to better understand the trade-offs between slow and late transition 
and sudden and disorderly transition, uh, all of which are, are permutations which might or might not um, unfold. So the goal is to research and policymakers on, on the kind of interventions which they might make to smooth that transition to net zero to, and to support the allocation of capital in a climate, climate resilient fashion for airports, for airlines, for everybody involved in that industry, given that we have a warming climate. So with that, uh, if I may, I'd like to introduce Bojan, Dr. Bojan Wang to talk us through his work. If I may encourage you though, to pose questions using the question feature, uh, that will help. I mean, I would, if I, you know, if I was in your shoes, I would put them in as soon as you think about them. We will then see them. And by the time Bojan comes to a conclusion, we'll have a set of questions which we can then play back to him to continue the conversation. So don't forget to ask your questions and put them in at any time. Bojan, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you, Jake, very much for this excellent introduction. And uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much today for joining us on this webinar. Uh, the topic of today's webinar is Assessing Climate Risks in Aviation, a Systematic Review. This is a part of my research here at CISL uh, under the fellowship supported by HITRO. So without further ado, let's get started. Back in 2017, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, or TCFD as we know it, published their recommendations on measuring and disclosing climate-related risks. The TCFD defined climate-related risks into two broad categories. One is transition risks, which refers to the risks uh, associated with our transitions towards net zero. The risks could come from the changes in policy and regulations, changes in technologies and market demand, and changes in reputation or public perceptions. The other category is physical risks, which refers to the physical impact of climate change on the routinely uh, business and operations of different economic sectors. These physical risks could be, could, could be acute risks, such as extreme weather events, or could be the chronic ones, uh, for example, the gradual changing patterns of climate change, rising sea levels or rising temperatures. The platform pro provided by TCFD really want to emphasize one concept, which is climate change is a financial risk to all sectors. It tries to link the risks with that we just described from the transition of physical with the strategic planning risk management and financial impact assessment of different sectors. Trying to quantify their material impact in terms of their impacts on companies' income, cash flow, and balance sheet. In order to do that, we need to price in the climate-related risk, risks into the daily risk assessment and investment decision makings. This research, therefore, is one of the first in-depth sectoral basis uh, assessment on the climate-related risks to the aviation sector. Aviation is a fast-growing sector and is also a major contributor to climate change. Over the past two decades, the global aviation demand measured by revenue passenger kilometers, or RPK, has increased by 7% per year between 2000 and 2019, before the COVID-19 pandemic. The fuel usage of aviation, thanks to the improvement of um, the aircraft engine efficiency, uh, has been increased slower compared with the RPK increase. In fact, the carbon intensity of aviation has declined by 70% since 1970. As a result of both, the greenhouse gas emissions of global aviation sector currently account for about 2.5 2 and 3% of the global total CO2 emissions. And uh, if we also take into account the non-CO2 emissions, Global aviation industry is responsible for about 3.5% of the global warming effects. We all know that the COVID-19 pandemic has hit the global aviation industry badly, but all the industry projections say that uh, the strong growth in demand will continue after we recover from the pandemic. Uh, the growth rate will expect, uh, is expected to uh, keep at a 3 or 4% per year. Uh, by 2050. In that case, if we keep a business as usual uh, 
measure, then the emissions from the aviation sector could double or even triple by 2050. So it posed a tremendous challenge for the aviation sector to decarbonize while the demand is still growing well very fast. The good news is that the aviation sector is committed to achieve net zero by 2050. In fact, a range of transition pathways or scenarios have been uh, published by international, international organizations, different governments, and also the industrial bodies. Those scenarios cover different scale. For example, uh, the IEA uh, sustainable development, uh, development scenarios and air transport action group scenario, and also the mission possible partnership climate ambition scenario as a global coverage to say how to achieve net zero of the global aviation industry. We also have the country and regional based scenarios, especially in the US, which is the world's largest domestic aviation market, published their 2021 Aviation Climate Action Plan scenario just before the COP26 last year. And Europe have also have its own destination 2050 net zero aviation uh, scenarios. For the UK, the six carbon budget published six different transition pathways for the UK aviation sector to achieve net zero by 2050. While aviation sector is a complex system, and the net zero transition of this sector may involve many different stakeholders, that's why uh, not only airlines and airports, but also uh, much wider uh, stakeholders such as policymakers and aircraft leasing companies and banks need to understand the implications of net zero transition in the aviation sector. So broadly speaking, we have four different options um, to push the aviation sector towards net zero. Curbing demand growth, fuel switch, technology and operation improvements, and auto sector offsetting. Given the time constraints, I won't go through every uh, stakeholders involved in those process, but uh, if we look at fuel switch, fuel switch means we, we're going to need uh, low carbon and sustainable aviation fuels to displace petroleum jet based jet fuels. That, that may involve fuel suppliers, uh, and they need to consider the production cost and market risks of producing the sustainable aviation fuels. And we also in, involve OEMs such as Boeing and Airbus to consider the revolutionary redesign of aircraft for hydrogen or ele uh, battery electric aircraft. Of course, airlines and airports will uh, have to face the increased operating cost and capital cost in terms of infrastructure changes and operation changes required. Also, aircraft leasing companies need to make the decisions on whether they start to purchase the air hydrogen and electric aircraft once the technology is ready, or keep to purchase the majority of the conventional aircraft uh, in the fleet. And finally, of course, Financial industry and banks need to start to evaluate their emissions intensity of the aviation portfolio and whether this portfolio is in line with their uh, net zero transition aligning uh, target. One of the key toolbox for av aviation sector to decarbonize is carbon offsetting. Carbon offsetting and re uh, reduction scheme for international aviation, or COSIA as we know it, uh, it was introduced in 2016 by the UN body uh, International Civil Aviation Agent uh, Organization, or ICAO. COSIA requires airlines to offset any growth in international aviation emissions above the 2019 and 2020 baseline from 2021 onwards. It has three phases, and not until 2017, uh, sorry, not until 2027, COSIA will remain voluntary basis. And uh, it will, uh, airlines will get the offset by purchasing the CO2 uh, emissions credits from the global carbon market. Whereas, despite its global coverage of COSIA, literature has uh, listed a long range of shortcomings of this uh, carbon offsetting program. First of all, uh, the coverage, it only focuses on CO2 emissions. So the non-CO2 emissions is not covered in this. And also, it doesn't include all countries globally. For the, for the least developed countries and other small countries and, uh, and small island developing countries, they will not be covered by this scheme. In addition, 
it only focuses on carbon neutral growth, which means it doesn't require absolute reduction in CO2 emissions relative to the baseline 2019 and 2020 emission level from the aviation sector. Also, COSIA heavily relies rely on the low-cost forest-based uh, project to generate carbon credits, whereas we all know that the increasing wildfires and forest fires put, put those uh, forest-based projects at risk. So the credits are not necessarily reliable to uh, make sure that uh, uh, to make sure sufficient carbon sinks through those projects. But the most of most important thing I think is the low price of Corsair. It doesn't stimulate any improvement or development of the new propulsion technologies or uh, low carbon uh, fuels in the aviation sector. So. Uh, because of its limited impact, COSIA will only address 33% of the aviation's overall contributions to the global warming effects. Clearly, it's not enough. That's why we have to pay attention to other uh, toolboxes to uh, that is available. Uh, fuel switch is a major part. We're trying to use low carbon fuels to replace petroleum jet fuels. And broadly speaking, we have four different options to choose biofuels, synthetic fuels, battery electric aircraft, and hydrogen. The first two, biofuels and synthetic fuels, also known as sustainable aviation fuels or SAFs, has the, has the biggest advantage of being dropping fuel, which means it doesn't require any changes to aircraft or air, airport infrastructure. In addition, because uh, those fuels are produced from either biogenetic feedstocks or non-biogenetic feedstocks. And uh, eventually, it's very similar to petroleum jet fuels. It doesn't have any limitations on the range for aircraft to use those fuels. In comparison, battery electric aircraft and hydrogen are more disruptive technology, which is not yet mature, uh, available, at least by 2030. And even if they are available, th there is a uh, limitations on the range. They are all or shorter range uh, airline market, which only account for about 30% of the total uh, airline markets. Therefore, we can see that SAFs are the only feasible option for low carbon fuel switching in mid to long range markets through, 20, uh, through 2050. To put that into perspective, uh, here I summarized all uh, the major transition options available and assessed in all the existing transition scenarios that we just saw before. And broadly speaking, we have five different transition options, avoided demand, improved operations, improved technologies, sustainable aviation fuels, and offsetting. So uh, this, box, this, this box plot showed that the different CO2 emissions reduction potentials relative to the baseline case scenarios or business as usual scenarios. So 100 means the, base, uh, the baseline emissions level, and uh, the box refers to different emissions reduction potentials. As we can say, the market-based offsetting colored in pink is a dominating lever in short term, but will be gradually displaced by the option of scaling up SAFs once this technology becomes more mature. And by 2050, all the existing transition scenarios assumes uh, the most CO2 emissions reduction comes from SAFs. And in fact, the medium uh, amount of uh, emissions reduction as percentage uh, from SAFs is about 40%, as we can see in year 2050. So SAFs is a really important uh, lever for aviation sector to decarbonize. Given its importance, let's uh, discuss a little bit more about SAFs. A few key facts in SAFs. First, the production volumes is still pretty low. It's less than 0.01% of the total aviation fuels in 2019. SAFs is, is currently still very expensive. The production cost is about two to six times of the price of jet fuels. And the climate benefits of SAFs have to be calculated on the life cycle basis. And the life cycle emission savings heavily depends on SAFs feedstocks and conversion processes, especially we need to take into account the indirect emissions from land use changes. Policy, strong policy push are required to support SAFs development uh, to make sure that SAFs will be 
more widely available and cost competitive uh, you know, in relatively short term. Here we see uh, some milestone policies that, that specifically for, uh, for, for facilitating self-development. Especially in 2020, the EU Refuel EU Aviation Initiative set specific funding targets for volume shares of SAFs that, has to, uh, that must be used in the European aviation sector by 2050. Also, the USA also launched the Sustainable Aviation Fuel Ground Challenge to produce at least 3 billion gallons of SAFs per year by 2030. So all those policies will, you know, will give the push that SAFs are needed for scale up. If we look at more specifically what policy measures uh, to consider to pr promoting SAF, one is a SAF blending mandates. Such policy set funding targets for aviation sector to utilize a certain quantity of SAFs by a target date. Well, this policy has its advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that it creates a market and guarantees the supply of SAFs by, place, by placing an obligation to supply SAFs on fuel suppliers and also potentially per, uh, play, uh, place an obligation to yield SAFs uh, on airlines. And it can, it can also set subset targets uh, for synthetic fuels, given that the current price of synthetic fuels are uh, significantly higher than uh, some relatively cheaper options such as uh, HEPA. So this sub-target will avoid uh, synthetic fuels to be crowded out by other cheaper options. The disadvantage of this policy is that it doesn't directly address the substantial cost of disparity between SAFs and jet fuels. It only creates a market that hopefully the price will go down, but it will require time. Also, the mandatory uh, blend, blending mandate requires to set this specific level of the target, whereas we have the uncertainties in the availability of SAFs. So it's really challenging to determine when to set the target, the target level of the mandate, and which fuels are eligible. Currently, the EU refuel EU aviation regulation already introduced this blending mandate, and the UK DFT also uh, have uh, it is also doing the public consultation on this policy measure. The second option is prioritizing SAFs through multipliers. It's setting a multiplier for the amount of SAFs used in aviation in calculating its contributions to climate targets. The advantage of this policy is that it provides immediate incentives for fuel providers to produce more SAFs over other uh, biofuels used in transport sector. Whereas the disadvantage is that it may only divert existing production from road sector rather than stimulating new advanced SAF production. So there is a bad or there is a trade-off between boosting the short-term production and stimulating the long-term SAF development. In fact, research has found that using a multiplayer may reduce the median overall climate benefit of the fuel policy, given that uh, it's the uh, Refer, it suggests a reduction in the biofuels provided to other transport, mo transport modes uh, on the ground transport. The final policy measures to be considered is, of course, the direct financial support, including production subsidies, grants for capital spending, price guarantees. All of them can be used to bridge the, the gaps between production cost and market price of SAFs. The advantage of this is that we have EU ETS and COSEA. Which, can, which could potentially generate a funding pool for directly fin financing those uh, SAF projects. And uh, it could directly address the expensive capital cost of SAF projects and also support the most efficient SAF producers by subsidizing the market price of SAFs up to a price floor level. Whereas the disadvantage of this is that it does require a substantial amount of public funding. And because those uh, Fundings are mainly from government and public sectors. It is riskier due to the potential government spending cut. And also the scale of the direct financial support could be limited to only uh, a number of fuel suppliers. So to sum up the materiality of transition risks in aviation, we know that air traffic de uh, demand growth, curbing air tra uh, traffic growth demand would be uh, would be the most significant transition of uh, risks for the aviation sector. The less than expected revenue growth uh, 
the during the transition through the curbing through curbing the uh, uh, demand growth would be very harmful for the industry development and also bad for the GDP growth. In terms of uh, risks from the technology changes, we have three options: dropping SAFs, hydrogen-based aircraft, and battery electric aircraft. Well, thanks uh, due to its dropping characteristics, SAFs would be uh, the transition options with the lowest level of risks. It only uh, increases airline operating cost and uh, somehow to, to, to some extent decreases the revenue due to the cost of pass through impact on demand, but uh, it doesn't require any changes in aircraft and uh, infrastructure. So that's, uh, that's not a systematic uh, change. But in comparison, for both hydrogen aircraft and battery electric aircraft, it would require significant changes in aircraft and the infrastructure. And for the short haul uh, jet, uh, short haul regional jets, it could become a stranded asset once those uh, hydrogen and electric aircraft become available. Of course, it will also increase airline and airport's capital and operating cost. For policy, we already know that cost air is not enough uh, to facilitate the low carbon transition of aviation. So if we only uh, if we rely on uh, Corsia too much, it would probably lead us to a too slow or too late transition. Well, we can definitely have this uh, targeted policy such as the soft blending mandate, but it also have uh, issues about investors' confidence in self field stock availability and techno tech uh, technological limits. Now, let's look at the other uh, side of the equation, climate-related physical risks. Compared with research on aviation's impact on climate change, the impact of climate change on aviation is relatively less researched. And the figure here sh showing what we already know from the existing research about the possible uh, impact from climate change on aviation, including the changing wind, in wind patterns, the rising sea levels, rising temperatures, and more extreme weather events. Well, the challenge is that uh, with not just need, uh, not only need to assess this impact, but also need to translate those impacts into the financial terms so that we can understand the magnitude of those impacts uh, to the aviation sector. This is actually quite challenging to do because it requires to link the climate models with economic and financial impact analysis, starting by using general circulation models, the ones used in IPCC report for projections of future daily temperature, precipitation, and wind under a given warming scenario. And then we need to use those projections downscaled in order to match those projections to individual airports, geolocations, or flight corridors, so that we can start to assess the material impacts of physical risk drivers to aircraft, airports, and airlines. After assessing, after assessing those, uh, those impacts, we then need to translate those impacts and in other words, pricing the physical risks as financial risk analysis variables in terms of revenues, capital cost, and operating cost. An example is to qu quantifying the physical risks that cause severe aviation system disruptions. Those disrupt disruptions could come from the sea level rise and the coastal flooding, could come from severe thunderstorms in summer seasons, and uh, uh, blizzards and heavy snows in winter seasons. Climate change literature already suggests that they, uh, as global, global warming effects, uh, all those three uh, physical risk travelers will become more frequent or intensified. For example, under a warming, high warming scenario, global airport at coastal flooding risk could increase, could more than double by 2000, uh, 2100. And in terms of its network scale impact, up to 20% of the roads between the at-risk airport and the remaining airport could be disrupted. Well, we also know that thunderstorms ranks number one in terms of its impact on airport operations. And under severe thunderstorms, an airport's throughput could be reduced by up to 75%, which is a huge impact on the airport operations. And we also know that blazers and snowfalls are the dominating causes for flight delays and cancellations. After exceeding certain thresholds, it would lead to flight cancellations and closures of airport. So what does it mean to, uh, to airport in terms of its financial materiality? We can see that the materiality of severe avi aviation system disruptions 
can come from the cost of the cost of flight del flight delays, cancellations, flight diversion, or the worst case scenario, airport closures. The three tab table shown here comes from Euro Control, give us and uh, gives us an idea about the cost of flight cancellation, diversion, and flight delays. Also, previous research suggested that a one-hour closure of London Heathrow Airport at its busiest hour could lead to an economic loss of 0.7 to 1.25 million euros just for an hour. So I would be more than interested to discuss with our colleagues from Heathrow whether this estimation uh, is reasonable. Apart from the severe disruptions uh, to airport operations, climate change will also uh, pose other physical risks, such as rising temperatures and heat waves. Increased frequency and intensity of hot extremes due to climate change could put on weight restrictions on aircraft takeoff rate, which means aircraft have to reduce their payload and fuel capacity in order to take off, especially in airports with relatively short runways. To put that into perspective, a 1% reduction in Boeing 737-800, which is a narrow body aircraft, will translate to about six passengers that will not be carried by the flight. And the 1% reductions from the Boeing 777-300, which is a larger, heavier, wide body aircraft, will translate to 24 passengers not carried by the flight. So these warming effects and weight restrictions will directly lead to the revenue losses for airlines and airports. On the other hand, uh, warming effects will also cause reductions in aircraft fuel efficiency. With current engine technology and airline network being fixed, research found that under the high warming scenarios, the annual aviation fuel consumption in 2100 would be about 1% higher than level of 2010. Well, the percentage increase is not, in, uh, is not large, but if we consider the huge uh, amount of fuel consumption by the global aviation sector, this would still lead to a considerable amount of extra cost due to the actual fuel burn. Lastly, we also have physical risk drivers from the changing upper level wind patterns. So global warming will increase both the vertical wind shear instability and the horizontal wind speeds at closing level. The increase of vertical wind shear instability will directly lead to greater risks of clear air turbulence, uh, which means the aircraft bumpiness in, uh, uh, on the sky. So uh, climate change would increase the frequency of severe uh, globally and uh, and at a very significant amount, as you can see, because uh, turbulence is a major hazard for the aviation sector. The increased frequency of cats would lead to an increased insurance cost and compensation for turbulence injured uh, in, induced injuries, which currently at about ten million dollars per year, and it also increased the operating cost uh, from for airlines to, to in, uh, when encountering and avoiding turbulence. So airlines have to uh, fly in a less optimal road that leads to uh, more fuel burns. At the moment, it's about 16 million US dollars per year cost in this regard. On the other hand, the increased horizontal wind speed will lead to a round trip flight journey time increase. Uh, the existing research found that in the North Atlantic corridor between London and New York, the round trip flight journey will increase, and this increase will directly lead to an increased operating cost due to the actual fuel burn. To conclude with some, uh, with some remarks, we know that the transition of aviation sector will involve many stakeholders, and because it's, it is a complex system, all the stakeholders involved must understand the implications of the net zero transition in the aviation sector and what they have to adjust in, in terms of their investment decisions or in terms of their uh, financial risks analysis. We also know that uh, OSEA as a major offsetting program uh, is not sufficient to reduce CO2 emissions from the global aviation sector. So relying on carbon offsetting in short to medium term may put us in a too late, too late or too slow transition. On the other hand, fuel switch is a much promising option. Scaling up SAFs is an orderly transition path, despite the necessity of strong policy push. In comparison, introducing hydrogen and battery electric aircraft has higher transition risks for three reasons. 
when it requires uh, significant changes in aircraft and airport uh, infrastructure. Two, uh, it, uh, it, uh, once this, uh, those technology are available for the short range market, it will put some regional jets and uh, existing fleets into uh, the risk or at the risk of stranded assets. Third, those technologies are still under development. So uh, if we want to wait until they, are, they become available by 2050, uh, at, at the earliest, then it could lead us to a too late and too slow transition. So overall, the transition risk of these two technology is higher. For the physical risks, we know that delays in fuel switch to phase out petroleum jet fuels in aviation could lead to higher physical risks, particularly from severe system disruptions caused by climate change. And finally, further research is needed to assess the combined impacts of transition and physical risks in the aviation sector. For example, we know that SAF will play a major role and the synthetic fuels which is produced from using renewable electricity and water and industrial CO2. This technology, the, this transition option uh, would, be, uh, would be in doubt if we consider that electricity supply becomes increasingly vulnerable, uh, vulnerable to the extreme heat because of climate change. So the next stop, uh, steps of my fellowship is to, to start developing the scenarios that looks at both the transition and physical risks uh, in the scenarios and also assess the interplays between these two. That's all for my presentation. Thank you very much and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, now I'm more than happy to take the questions. Over to you, Jake. Thank you so much, Bajan. Uh, it was really interesting, and I, I would encourage uh, participants to log their questions in the uh, in the um, in the question facility so that we can make sure your voices are heard. Uh, you've you've achieved quite a lot, I think, Bajan, in the first uh, basically the first year of this. So really excited to see how uh, this research is going to develop over the um, entirety of your fellowship. I mean, I have to say, listening to you, it. it <laughs> It, it, it's it's a very challenging uh, it's a very challenging presentation for the industry and for anyone who is engaged with aviation. So many questions, so many risks, so many shifts are on the horizon. Uh, I just wanted to ask um, one one general question, one specific one. While we're um, we're waiting for a few more questions to arrive, uh, the general one is how <clears throat> I mean is do you do you detect an in, an alignment between the various stakeholders engaged in, in aviation, whether that's, you know, air, aircraft manufacturers or airports or airlines or engine manufacturers or the travel industry more broadly, is is this something the industry is really closely looking at and looking at in a in an aligned sense, or do you see lots of different alternatives and airs running and uh, you know different approaches which haven't yet resolved into a common strategy for the industry? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jake. Uh, well, the good news is uh, the industry and also the policymakers have have uh, gen generally a quite good consensus on what options are available for aviation sector to, to decarbonize. So we have uh, we have market-based measures, we have policies to curbing uh, demand growth, we have fuel switch using especially SAFs and also uh, out-of-sector uh, offsetting. So the, op the options available are kind of in, in consensus. The, the difference is really across different existing transition scenarios is to what extent different transition options develop um, are needed in order to achieve this net zero transition. For example, some scenarios is, uh, for, uh, 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 for example, the UK six carbon budget scenarios, the balanced, uh, balanced net zero pathways put a great emphasis on out of sector offsetting so not only from from the, uh, those uh, forest-based projects, but also techno technological uh, approaches such as uh, direct air capture. So it doesn't require the uh, absolute reductions or significant uh, emissions reductions within the aviation sector. Instead, it uh, requires airlines to kind of pay for the out-of-sector offsetting program. But the question is that how reliable are those offsetting projects are? On the one hand, we already seen that the forest-based uh, offsetting projects could be 
the, the, the effects could be compromised by wildfires, uh, forest fires. Uh, on the other hand, the technology-based ones, such as direct air capture, this technology is very costly, and uh, it, uh, it, its development is still kind of in the early stage. So, it, uh, so airlines can't rely on such mm. technologies to achieve the out okay. sector offsetting. Well, I, <clears throat> yes, I, I agree. The offsetting question still is uh, looms quite large in terms of reliability. Uh, it, it, it's, potent, it's possible we should run a, an entire webinar on that question. We have quite significant resources in the university, in fact, a new centre looking at offsetting strategies. But yes, it's a, it's a big question mark. Uh, my, uh, before I go on to an audience question, the, the other one I had was about, I, I, I may be mistaking, um, misunderstanding, but I think you were sort of indicating SAFs as a sort of lower risk strategy for fuel shift as opposed to hydrogen and, and uh, battery electric. Uh, are you taking into consideration there some of the system uh, uh, system links? For example, if it's biofuels based, what we already know about the sustainability of biofuels and the you know the potential for competition between uh, different forms of land use, sure. energy, fiber, food, etc. Is that, or are we looking at this in very much in isolation as a fuel source for the aviation industry? I wanted to see how embedded and contextual your thinking was there. Sure. So in terms of, in terms of SAFs, uh, one thing I need, I need to I want to uh, highlight is that SAFs is the only feasible options to cover the long range uh, aviation market, which account for more than seventy percent. So hydrogen and the, and the, uh, battery electric aircraft, even if the technology is available, it still only covers the short range. Hydrogen has a ha, has the potential to uh, to go to the long range, but it would, would require revolutionary redesign of uh, aircraft. So in terms of SAFs, uh, yes, indeed, we need to consider the uh, life cycle uh, emissions implications of using SAFs. So we have uh, crop-based feedstocks and non-crop feedstocks for biogenetic or biofuels. So uh, uh, the one you mentioned is indirect emissions from, direct, uh, from land use is mainly a constraint or challenge for the crop-based uh, feedstocks for, for SAFs. But the good news is that we can use, uh, for example, the municipal solid waste as a uh, non-crop based uh, feedstocks and also wasted uh, uh, unused, uh, unused oils as, uh, as a non-crop okay. based feedstocks. So it doesn't compete with the land. As ever, it's a, it's a more complex question, which I'd have to simplify. Um, mm -hmm. Great question from the audience here, which is, demands we look at this at a, at a fully macro level. So the question is, to what extent could the negative impact of demand reduction in aviation on GDP, how could, could that be offset by passengers shifting to other mass transit options? So in other words, is there going to be a, a, a lasting GDP effect if passengers simply you know, use other transport modes, such as trains, uh, obviously particularly with short haul in mind? And the, and the subsequent growth of those industries? Sure, that's a great question. I think uh, the first part is relatively easy to, to, to answer. Uh, if you look at the impact of COVID-19 and uh, the, uh, to, to aviation sector and uh, the knockdown effects on the global economy growth, that's a straightforward answer. So if we try to rely on the policies to curb in demand, it will definitely hurt the GDP growth. And uh, it's very hard to kind of uh, uh, make up to these losses or negative impact from curbing the demand. So this kind of policy is not necessarily very popular across the, uh, within the industry. On the other hand, uh, for mode substitu substitution, in fact, my PhD thesis uh, specifically assessed the substitution effects of high-speed rail and uh, short-range short uh, air transport in the, uh, in the Chinese market. Uh, uh, what I found is that uh, the substitution effects of high-speed rail, which is the only uh, uh, kind of available low carbon high speed transport mode compared to compared to aviation. It only generates positive emissions savings in the short to medium ranges. What we are talking about is about 500 kilometers to 800 kilometers. Above that level, aviation is still the dominant in, uh, transport mode and can hardly be replaced or substituted by other transport mode. Uh, so yes, indeed we can. We can encourage in, uh, using high-speed rail, but it has implications for different country settings. For, for example, the, the cost of land 
is very cheap for China because China, uh, the Chinese government owns the land, whereas for the UK, the high speed rail too uh, has been in debate on decades, but it's and the, the cost of construction and also uh, used high speed rail would not necessarily be as competitive as those in China due to the cost issue. Thank you, Bajan. And I, I guess that um, that question of, uh, uh, of ex part of this comes down, I think, to the public's expectations about what how it wants to travel. So how you know how easily do we want to be able to travel to the other side of the world at a moment's notice? Uh, I mean, obviously, going back in time historically, that wasn't possible. So people found accommodated that and found different ways to. Uh, you know, to, to relate to the outside world, maybe to jump on a ship or something like yeah. that, and it would take six months. It's, it, it's all, I think what you're saying is sort of must be set within a, the context of public expectations about mobility generally, and also the different modes within it, but it's all, it's all clearly nested. But a good question here from, um, from, from Matt Gorman at Heathrow, which is how do you see the wider, uh, the, the, the wider transition in the economy um, enabling, helping to enable or perhaps inhibit aviation to decarbonize, for example, the need for hydrogen, that's not something which is specific only to aviation. That's potentially yeah. something in steel manufacturing, for example, or other, other parts of the economy. How, how is all that going to come together? Uh, well, that's a great question. Um, I think the aviation sector, it wouldn't be possible for aviation sector to, to achieve its natural transition without the transition for, uh, of the entire economy. Give you two very quick ex examples. One is hydrogen, as you mentioned. Hydrogen need to be produced from renewable, resource, uh, renewable sources. We have two categories. One is green hydrogen and one is blue hydrogen. If we use blue hydrogen, which is produced from natural, nat natural gas, then the uh, climate implications is actually higher for using hydrogen, uh, for, for using hydrogen to, to, to fuel uh, aviation sector because uh, both the synthetic fuels and 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 the hydrogen-based aircraft requires quite a lot of hydrogen. And if hydrogen produced from relatively dirty electricity, that would be an issue. So we need to decarbonize the, how hydrogen is produced. The second uh, related uh, example is about uh, power generation sector. So so we know that if we want to transition to uh, synthetic fuels or hydrogen. And still we need uh, a tremendous increase in the electricity production and, and uh, the grid capacity. So those, those electricity has to come from renewable, uh, renewable sources. And get, that has the implications of the cost of synthetic fuels. Once we have the electric, renewable electricity becomes cheaper, then it have a direct knock-on effect on the synthetic fuels. The, the production cost of synthetic fuels will also become cheaper. So in other words, uh, in order to use those uh, advanced uh, low carbon fuels in the aviation sector, we need the faster transition for the whole economy. Thank you, Bajan. That's really interesting. And, and presumably those kind of interlinkages are, are part of the, the modeling effort behind the work. We, we yep. recognizing there the interdependence of the different factors you've mentioned. Um, another great question here, which is, how do you see transition risk, let's say in aviation, evolving over time, particularly given that the policy measures which you've outlined may not happen at the speed which would be optimal for, for example, meeting net zero. We might not get the stimulus for the SAF market, for example, at the right time. So what does that mean in terms of transition risks? Is that, are we looking at a kind of escalating set of risks or is it manageable? Uh, again, that's a great question. I, I think uh, when we consider transition risks, often we only consider orderly transition or disorderly transition, but indeed we also need to consider the, risk of, the risks of the failure of the transition. So that could pose perhaps more significant impact on our economy. So one, so so we we know that we have the options available. SAFs is a, it seems it's a, a, an orderly transition option. So we need a strong policy push. It doesn't necessarily mean a sudden transition because uh, the good news is, for example, the, the uh, 
the uh, bending mandate of the subs uh, adopted by the EU, it only requires a gradual increase of the uh, the amount of cells to be used in aviation. It's created a market. It not necessarily will require all the airlines immediately use cells and without using any other existing technologies. So we give we gives us an opportunity to kind of have this uh, smooth and orderly transition. Why not take it? The policies we need uh, have been extensively discussed uh, in, in the think tanks and also international organizations. We uh, uh, just as we're seeing in, in this in our presentation, we have three different options to promote uh, to promote sales. And the, the, well, although those those policies have its advantages and disadvantages, but I'm sure the policymakers can find some spaces to take advantage of those uh, the, the the advantage of those 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 policies, whereas uh, uh, even have a mixture of different policies to encourage the, the sales. I would say the most Mm -hmm. Our unwise option is to wait and see, and wait and see uh, strategy will put us into much, uh, much, much, much worse uh, future. So, and, and Bojan, when uh, you say when you say wait and see, do you mean the policy community waiting and seeing, or do you mean the industry? Well, it, I think that's a chicken and egg issue. Uh, the policy are, are, are required for. For, for the self market, for example, for the self industry to kind of guarantee the supply so that few suppliers have these incentives or, you know, or uh, guarantee, uh, have these incentives to, to produce selves. If we only rely on industry movement, and uh, we all know that selves, even for the lowest, uh, the cheapest ones, HIFA is still about uh, two times cost higher than the uh, jet fuels. So the I do think policymakers should make a move first mm. and create a market for the industry to, to follow. Okay, now I have another question on transition risk, but I'm just going to hold that for one second and ask you something about the physical side. Um, are, are airports responding? Are, are they becoming more resilient in their infrastructure and their management as a, as a strategy alongside planning for the the overall transition of the industry and protection from transition risks. What about the rest? Is this something which the industry is locked onto now and you know, giving the, the kind of attention in your view that is, is necessary given the escalating challenge? Thanks, Jake. Uh, um, I, think, I, I think if we consider the adaptation and resilience efforts that airports or major international airports have been made, it's actually pretty good. For example, London Heathrow Airport have their uh, regular assessments on adaptation and resilience, and they understand quite well about the challenges on the physical side of risks. Um, but we also have to bear in mind that uh, uh, the, the global globally is not only there are not only major airports but smaller and poor regions. Uh, they also have their airports, and those airports are much more vulnerable to the physical risks. And since aviation sector is quite a quite a special case because it uh, it, it is a complex system and it's uh, have a net a global network, so only guarantee individual airports resilience uh, on the physical side of risks such as uh, Heathrow Airport and uh, all the uh, Amsterdam Schiphol Airport. Those major airports doing just fine um, uh, them, themselves, but their networks, other destination airports, could be very vulnerable. And as we can see from the, uh, my, my presentation, up to 20% of the roads connecting the major airports uh, at which are at risk and other remaining airports in, within the network could be seriously disrupted by sea level rise. So okay. that means that, that, that means policymakers should also consider how to how, how to support those smaller airports to improve their adaptation and resilience. So it's a it's a mixed picture, but um, clearly the network is 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 critical in aviation. Yeah. There's no point flying from a resilient airport into yeah. one which is not resilient because that won't have the desired effect. Um, mm. Back to transition risks again. There's a question here, uh, which I think is more to the abrupt end or disruptive end of the transition risk spectrum. Yeah. What is your view on short flights ban or short flight bans or policies to restrict? 
short flights altogether? Are they effective to decarbonize the sector? Should we expect some countries or, or regions to adopt this kind of policy in the future, perhaps the short or, or even midterm future? Sure, uh, great question. I, I think, first of all, we need to consider if we want to, uh, to use those kind of policies to ban the short-term flights, do we have any other alternatives? For countries like uh, like like Spain or, or Germany or uh, other European countries that has has been real links, fine, uh, it could be an option. Whereas, uh, what about other countries that doesn't have the has been real? Then banning the short-term flights would mean that the passengers or travelers will will suffer the most, and I wouldn't say that's a very smart policy uh, in that perspective. And and also even if we have a high speed rail for short term, again, uh, as well as I said before, the short the short range uh, market is the only market that battery electric aircraft and uh, hydrogen aircraft without the uh, significant change in uh, aircraft design could be feasible option. So why not banning them with uh, instead of encouraging policies and investment to developing such te technologies? In that, uh, in that sense, then the uh, customers or air travelers will still enjoy the short range flight without posing any uh, negative impact on climate. Yeah, that, that, let's uh, let's um, draw this to a close, I think, on, on that uh, more or less positive note, the uh, call there from Bojan to uh, the policy community and, and the industry itself to work on a, a positive orderly and if but effective transition and i guess we get into the territory of things like bans or perhaps more dramatic policies when confidence that you know the industry and not just the aviation industry of course any industry isn't making those kinds of changes that's when you you end up getting into different kind of territory but yes as ever the the solutions and the ideas and the thinking is mostly there not entirely there that gives opportunities for people like Boeing to continue research but um, the question is, how do they come together and how do we build alignment around the various stakeholders involved? And in fact, um, elsewhere in the University of Cambridge, we have something called the Aviation Impact Accelerator led by um, the, the Whittle Laboratory in the engineering department here in Cambridge and ourselves, which has been looking at some of those system questions, um, many of which uh, Bojan has touched on and looking at some of the solutions. So. I think we have the solutions in many cases. What we need is the um, the alignment and the commitment to to making them effective. So I'd like to thank um, I'd like to thank Bojan very much for that presentation. Uh, very clear, very concise, quite sobering in places. Obviously, we'd like to thank Heathrow as well for making this possible through the support that they've provided to CISL to uh, undertake this independent research. Uh, so thanks very much there, and to all of you um, for taking the time to join us today to hear about uh, uh, risks and solutions in the aviation industry. So managed to finish a couple of minutes to give you all a break before whatever you're doing at uh, two o'clock in the UK. Hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, we have one more of these uh, webinars in due course, which I hope some of you'll be able to attend. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you, everyone. Bye.